three, two, one. Hey, everyone, and thank you for joining us on your Wednesday afternoon as we kick off the new year with a fantastic conversation with a speaker who very likely needs no introduction. Uh, we're going to give him one anyway, though. Uh, I'm personally very excited to jump in today's conversation, one that we're calling Building Your Startup in 2021 with Peter Crisdale. Uh, he's not the original director of this chapter of Startup Guide, but he's pretty darn close. That's why he probably looks pretty familiar to anybody who has been on one of these before. Uh, my name is Joshua Ness, and I am a fellow director here at Startup Grind New York City. Uh, I'm also a senior manager at Verizon 5G Labs, where I work with startups, academia, and enterprise teams to build a 5G-powered world. Let me tell you how exciting that is. Uh, Startup Grind is the world's largest community of startups, founders, innovators, creators, bringing like-minded and diverse individuals together to give startups everywhere the education, opportunities, and access they need to build, grow, and scale their companies. And part of being on the Startup Grind team means I get to have meaningful conversations like this that address certain aspects of building a company and how to deal with the grind that goes along with entrepreneurship. And we also talk to experts about the advancement of technology, as well as exploring barriers to inclusion and how to create opportunities for representation and allyship in the community. At the end of the day, we really try to live up to Starcrime's global values. And we believe in making friends, not contacts. We believe in giving instead of taking. And we believe in helping others before helping ourselves. Having said all that, I do want to turn it over to Peter. Uh, Peter, go ahead and give us a quick introduction to the man behind the legend. What are we doing here? <laughs> boy, oh boy. Um, well, I don't know how to uh, summarize myself quickly. Um, I will say that uh, I'm currently a uh, lucky to be a part of the Minerva team. Um, we uh, are, I think, soon to be 12 folks. Um, my, uh, my role is SVP of hard problems, um, which is probably my favorite business title. <laughs> what does that even mean? Um, uh, yeah, good question. Um, it's meant a lot of different things. So I just celebrated um, one year working with Minerva um, and was was an early member of the founding team. Um, and I think my job is probably, in terms of what I actually do, has probably changed every two months for the last 12 months. <laughs> yeah, so, whatever that hard um, problem is, huh? <laughs> yeah, I think a lot of it was just figuring out initially um, how to have those early user interviews um, and and put a preliminary product in the hands of customers in a way or potential customers in a way that we'd actually get valuable feedback. Um, that turned into doing an initial product hunt launch. Um, and uh, we were fortunate uh, and quite successful there, um, which then turned into our CEO doing full-time fundraising and me kind of taking on a sales responsibility um, that he had done. Um, we then hired someone in a sales capacity and I've now been focusing more on growth. Um, so specifically user growth, starting to understand in more detail who our target um, members are, um, people that but who can be great users of our platform. And um, that's where we stand today. We're actually, I think, knock on wood, gonna be bringing on a growth marketer soon. Um, so it continues to evolve. That's fantastic. I think we're going to talk a little bit about marketing here today um, as we dive into some of your history and what 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 got you to where you are. Um, before we kick things off officially, uh, everyone in the audience, please make sure to drop your questions in the chat. You can see it's already pretty lively in there already. Um, we'll be answering these throughout today's conversation instead of a formal Q&A at the end. Um, but at the end, we'll have an opportunity um, for you to tell the rest of us what you're working on, where you need help, or how you can offer help if that's your thing. Um, so, Peter, I know you're, I mean, it's, this is kind of interesting because I know your story. Um, I'm really excited to, to hear you tell it in almost a sequential order to see if I learn anything new. I'm sure that I will. Um, but you've always had this history of entrepreneurship. Um, as, I, as, as I know you, you you've, never you've never really worked for anyone else. Um, tell me about how this journey all started. Like you, you went to Cornell and you were in the Peace Corps, right? Yes, that is correct. So um, originally born in Toronto, um, although my mom is American, so I have dual citizenship with the U.S. and Canada, um, which uh, is why people have accused me of being so nice. 
Um, <laughs> I try to prove them wrong occasionally, but it's usually the truth. Um, and yes, I grew up outside of DC, Washington, DC, um, ended up going to Cornell for engineering. Um, and, uh, you know, I had, I had an engineering internship while I was in college, um, that really pushed me away from a more traditional route. Um, I did the internship at, a at an engineering firm called Parsons, Brinkerhoff, Quaid, and Douglas in One Penn Plaza, Midtown Manhattan. Um, and uh, I lived, a, I, I split a bedroom with someone in Jersey City to try to minimize rent as much as I could and commuted like an hour into the Midtown every day. Um, and I strongly disliked it. <laughs> um, I, I had a cubicle, I had a desk. I was like, you know, one of the, literally one of the most exciting projects I did was um, try to calculate the rate at which road salt falls in on itself to to like better understand the volume of a salt shed. Um, that that was like I got excited about that one because <laughs> <laughs> compared to the other ones, um, and so uh, I had this strong feeling that uh, I was far more creative and excited to do something new and different relative to the opportunities that I had um, to do any kind of engineering work coming out of college. Um, and so I took a big left turn and said, you know, I'm really passionate about helping people. Um, and I feel like I want to, you know, I have this wanderlust. I have, I have a desire to go out and understand the world. And so I joined the Peace Corps. Um, took uh, about a year actually just to get through the application process. Um, but I uh, was deployed in a country called Burkina Faso, um, which some folks might also know previously, it was called Upper Volta. Um, most people, including myself, when I first learned about it, had no idea where it was. <laughs> um, it's in the middle yeah. of West Africa. Yeah. Um, and I ended up living there for the next three years. Um, and so, um, among other things, uh, uh, that is actually where I discovered a passion for entrepreneurship. Um, I saw a lot of aid money, a lot of aid effort, um, NGOs and things like that, really going into trying to spur a system where the things that were motivating actual, uh, uh, actual uh, health within the Burkina Faso economy um, were a lot of private enterprise um, and people who were taking it upon themselves to try to build something. Um, so I uh, came back to the US, uh, ended up in New York City about 10 years ago um, and became very fortunate. I fell really into the tech entrepreneurship scene from there um, by just being new to the city and going out to a ton of meetups and finding people who, uh, who resonated with the kind of crazy that I am <laughs> and uh, got to um, got to try out a lot of different projects, work on a lot of different things. Um, eventually had an idea that I was passionate about um, enough that I said, like, let me just go all in on this, um, which was called Strategy Hack. Um, yeah, which is how we're going to we're going to dive into that here in a second. Uh, I'm yeah. really curious about Burkina Faso. Yeah. I know you and I have talked about that. Um, I think the most really talked about that was when I talked about my extreme distaste of okra. And you said that there was there were dishes there that were made almost entirely of what you find inside of okra, which is just terrifying yes, to me. That is correct. Um, <laughs> I'm curious about like as you as you as you saw firsthand what this this entrepreneurship looked looked like from a, from like a, a like a almost like a raw perspective of people they had to solve problems really in order to make people's lives better. And so they took it upon themselves to do so. Um, like what, what did that teach you? Like what was your takeaway from that? Hmm. I, I mean, first of all, when you, when you talk about um, that mentality and that kind of level of effort um, that people are putting into their lives, um, you know, we're talking about um, a lot of the major transportation in the country is, um, buses that were um, kind of repurchased from China that were originally built in the 1950s um, and and folks on a regular basis being creative about how to fix these engines. I mean, I mean literally like broken down on the side of the road um, in the desert, like 
trying to figure out how to get the car started again. Wow. Like it's, <laughs> it's a very different level of what, what I might now in retrospect call entrepreneurial spirit, which is a lot more like, we just have to get this done. Like how do, how do we solve it's, it's like MacGyvering <laughs> definitely. Yeah. Necessity um, being the mother of invention. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, uh, but there's also a lot of endemic um, issues that are really um, keeping people from exploring a lot of potential opportunities. Um, everything from um, poor healthcare to poor educational systems to um, major economic issues that, that are quite complicated. Um, and so actually one of the things that sticks out to me as a small example of that is um, Burkina Faso had at the time, I'm not, this is 15 years ago, I'm not sure if it's still the case, um, likely it is, uh, had a 75% tariff on all electronics. Um, huh. Meaning that if, uh, if a laptop wholesale in the US was going to be $200, say it's an IBM ThinkPad, um, then you had to pay an additional 150 as an importer. So right off the bat, the wholesale price for that laptop is 350. Mm -hmm. And if you then wanted to sell it at, you know, any kind of profit, um, then you're now talking about selling a laptop for maybe a $200 laptop for $500 in a place where at the time the average income, like middle-class income was like 125, $150 a month. Um, and so lots, lots of issues to unpack there. Um, yeah. which I was totally, uh, unprepared for, but I, I got what I was looking for, which was a major world education. Yeah. And so how did you apply that experience leading into your, your next venture? I know you, 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 when I first met you, uh, it was at a, a growth hacking meetup. And um, my story about coming to New York also almost 10 years ago, nine years ago next week um, uh, is my, is, is my uh, New York anniversary. Um, I started going to meetups uh, because I didn't know anybody and I needed to, to eat um, to, and, and meetups have um, usually free drinks and they have people. And for me, those are the three things that I needed uh, as somebody who came to New York with no job, no friends, no place to live. And uh, so I, started, I swear I had, no, I had no interest in startups or technology whatsoever. They just had the best meetups. And um, uh, yeah, a shout out to Andrew Zarek, who, who ran Digital Dumbo at the time. That was one of the, my favorite ones to go to. And, uh, and so what I, that's where I started to go to, to get involved in the community. And at the time, I was actually doing marketing for um, an event management agency that's based in Portland, Oregon. And, uh, and so I, I met you because you put your hand up and you said, I have a wacky idea. I have this weird idea that people who do startups and people who do marketing should talk to each other. Like what led you to that point where you started what ended up being just this Saturday workshop that you started that turned into a company? Yeah, I appreciate that. I'll, I'll try to connect the dots a little bit. Um, I think uh, I was definitely, um, I think definitely coming out of the Peace Corps experience, um, I was certainly inspired, I think primarily by the idea that, uh, that business was not something that you had to go to business school and, and wear a suit um, and, and have certain sort of um, Excel skills to necessarily execute. That, that business was something that actually um, had a real role in society um, and could actually improve the lives of people. Um, I, I think if I had to try to distill it, that was a major insight from the whole Peace Corps experience for me personally. Um, then bringing that into New York, I was really, I was looking for problems to solve. Um, and as I was, um, had two startup experiences prior to the one that you're describing, Strategy Hack. Um, I started to get to, I was just chatting with a lot of people. I was going to the meetups and I was starting to see this pattern of talking to people at these meetups or, or seeing things online where people had these really interesting novel products. 
Um, but I could see that they just didn't know how to present them or talk about them in a way that was um, clearly communicating the actual value of the thing that they built. Um, and at the same time, then I was also going to a bunch of meetups where there were professional marketers who were like super excited about the idea of a startup um, and, and digital marketing and programmatic ads and, uh, and, and, you know, some of these more like marketing oriented terms that were cutting edge at the time. Um, and just that the, the, they were like ships passing in the night. No one, you know, you had this incredible ability to communicate and this incredible ability to build product and they weren't talking to each other, but they were both huge groups of people in New York City. Um, so that's kind of the inspiration to seek out opportunities to start up. There was, there was a big program called Startup Weekend at the time that was also very like foundational and inspirational to say, like, what if you just try to get together over a weekend and, and see what you can do together? Um, and so that was very much kind of the impetus to say, well, a bunch of other people are creating meetups. Um, there are these two groups that should know each other that don't. Um, can we create an event or some kind of thing so that the communicators can help the product people communicate? Um, and then, and then I just went and and said that idea to a bunch of people, um, and and folks got excited about it. Yeah, I remember at, at this particular event, uh, you were mobbed by startup founders because they realized that they needed marketing um, because this was back in 2013 when the idea of spending um, seed round money on marketing support was laughed at. And it was all about build the product, build the product, build the product. And so um, so the as the story goes, I was in a marketing function and looking for things to do and people to meet and handed you my business card and said, hey, I'll, I'll be a I'll be one of the marketing people. Um, yeah. And uh, showed up at this event and, um, and and met you and met the team at the time. People like um, Siwat Sinsagoa and Helen Cho and um, and uh, gosh, I mean, it was a, it was a lifetime ago. Luis and, Vasquez. Um, yeah, um, Luis Vasquez. Yeah. There's one of the things that I've found myself reflecting on repeatedly is how many um, how many cycles of folks have gone through New York City Tech in the last now 10, nine, 10 years that we've been a part of it. Um, yeah. And and yeah, you know, those those names that you just mentioned, those folks are like a big part of that formative time for me, certainly. Um, of those, I think Siwat is, uh, is the one who really like became real entrepreneur, has a, mm -hmm. has a beverage company now called Recoup. And, and all those other folks went on to do great things as well. Um, but entrepreneurship can be a grind too and it's it can grind people down yeah it can and i and i think through the experience of building strategy hack as an organization and then eventually incorporating the business um you and i going in as, as partners in this um we we ended up pivoting and, and realizing another gap and i think i want to take a second just to focus on this idea of entrepreneurship as discovery and um and figuring out um, uh, what we did there to determine how we were going to position this as a company, um, almost almost the same way that um, some of those lessons that you might have learned in Burkina Faso about um, about needing to people needing to provide a service that made people's lives better in order to keep things yeah. functioning. Um, there were conversations that you and I had about how do we take this model and 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 maybe pivot it to some to to to, to, to organizations that might need this kind of support even more than these founders do? I think when I think about um, everything that I've learned, I feel like there are, there are very positive examples and negative examples. Um, and so along those lines, I think one of the negative examples that I took out of my Peace Corps experience was the time that it takes to execute something. Um, and And what I mean by that is when it came to aid dollars and development, um, the the cycles there are so slow. I mean, years long um, to make a funding decision um, for an amount of money that turns out to be um, somewhat trivial relative to the size of the economy and, and major other factors that are taking place. Um, and then um, one of my early startup experiences, um, I remember 
spending a lot of time focusing on product tweaks. Um, this is prior to strategy hack. And, um, and we'd have this hypothesis of, um, we think that, that these people are going to buy this software. And we talked to like one or two of them and they said, well, if it just had this feature and that feature, we would buy it. So we spent the next three months based on two product interviews. Um, and then found out that actually all that stuff that we built wasn't that valuable, but maybe this other audience. And so we ended up going through like three of those cycles over the course of a year and then ran out of money and that was kind of it. Um, so with strategy hack, I think we, I think we probably pivoted five or six times over the course of the, uh, time that we worked on it. Um, we had a lot of different hypotheses. Um, I think ultimately, uh, from my perspective, what we were able to prove is that the need was there um, and that people were really excited about the opportunity to spend time together. Um, what we were never able to find was a repeatable and scalable business model. Um, and so we started with the simple fact of these people should talk to each other. Let's create an event. It's going to be super cheap. We're just going to, we're literally going to cover the costs of the event, um, food and space rental. Um, so it was like, pulled off the event for like a thousand bucks or something like that um, for a weekend event. And then um, kind of weren't really sure where to go from there. Um, we started saying, well, we have this kind of like two-sided marketplace. Like we like, should we charge one side? Should we charge the other side? Does it make any sense to charge both? Um, we eventually ended up in a position where we said, well, maybe we could charge marketing agencies and those agencies might just pay, you know, 500 or a thousand dollars a person for this as a learning and development exercise. Um, and so we actually did sell one of those. Um, what, what I personally learned through that experience is that I had no idea how to do B2B selling. <laughs> um, and so as, as much as I think we had an interesting, uh, offering, I also think that we suffered from not having professionalized understanding of, of how to really go out and, and take this to market and sell it. Mm -hmm. Um, and so again, that's another lesson learned that then became super helpful in, in the following two major projects that I did after that, where I eventually became better at just figuring out, like, how do you sell things? Um, I, you know, for, for whatever, uh, insight I had into communication and, and marketing, I certainly didn't have it for sales. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that was a, an interesting time. Uh, we ended up, uh, as, as a company, we ended up having another, um, trying to go the, 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 the corporation route and seeing if corporate marketers would, or cor uh, if, if major industry organizations would, would be interested in their marketing teams going through this kind of an experience and um, ended up being, being a pretty successful engagement. And, um, but I think you're right at the end of the day, um, it was it was a, an, it was an interesting value proposition that probably had a lot of value, um, but it was just very difficult to communicate in a way that um, made it worthwhile. Also, uh, a lot of lip service paid. A lot of people really loved talking to us and really loved the idea until it came time to put money on the table. Mm -hmm. um, then all of a sudden, a lot of unanswered emails. Right. Um, <laughs> and so that that was a big lesson generally in saying like. All right. To in order to validate and and iterate and move quickly, you actually need to like get people to belly up to the table and put money down. Um, yeah. Is this valuable enough? Is it solving such a significant pain point that you're actually willing to put skin in the game? Um, that turned out to be a big differentiator, and we we were never able to cross that line. Yeah, I think uh, it was about that same time that. And I think it probably was the same for you, but around the same time that I started to feel like I had a place in the community because we were, there was a lot of lip service paid and we did have a lot of respect because we had already started coming in and, and running these startup grind events as well. Um, and I think right then we started realizing that entrepreneurship can provide a platform depending on who the audiences are. And, and for us, our audience was the, the rest of the New York City ecosystem. Um, and I think that gave us some opportunities to, um, to, to promote things like um, inclusion and, and equal treatment and shared values and things like that. Um, that was one of the things that, that I took away from it that I really enjoyed um, is, is, is being in a position to, to, to be a positive influence on the community. I, I'm curious if you feel the same way. 
Yeah, absolutely. Um, and the uh, and I know that we were helpful to to lots of people. We worked with over a hundred startups in a very short period of time. Some of which actually, I mean, changed their name, changed their website, completely changed the look and feel of their brand, uh, just based on a relatively short interaction. Um, and so, and um, you know, we had some companies actually go through the process that were. Rel relatively well-known companies later on. Um, and mm -hmm. so there's definitely a lot to be proud of. And I think it was, it was certainly a community contribution. Um, I, I wish, of course, that we could have actually turned it into a proposition of actually being able to pay ourselves to do it. Right. <laughs> what, what do you think is different between now and, and then? Like we, and not only necessarily just everything that you've learned, but everything that you've learned combined with this, this environment that we find ourselves in, you know, with 2020 being such a crazy year to, to even be starting a company the way that, that you have, what, what would you say are some of the big differences um, in, 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 the, in the ecosystem and in the environment? Um, and, and what did you learn from those first few companies that you ran that prepared you for starting a company in, in a turbulent time as 2020? Yeah, I mentioned this idea of, of cycles and lot, lots of people kind of coming into the entrepreneurial community and going back out, but there's also um, cycles in terms of thinking about how to build a tech startup. Um, you know, just some of the few differences. So, so I think we wound that down in 2015. So we're now talking about five and a half, six years. Um, huge emergence, which just started at the time around um, SaaS thinking and best practices. Um, you know, in those days, 2014, 2015, I think um, like Facebook Auth or Google Auth were relatively new concepts. Um, we've we've had this whole emergence of direct to consumer. Um, we've had Amazon become like the pipes of delivering almost everything to your house. Um, just the advancement in the thinking, the, the amount of capital invested has probably 10 X in that period of time. I don't, I don't know the numbers offhand, but it's incredible, not just from venture capital, but also from private equity on the higher side, um, because venture, venture capital backed startups need to exit somehow. And if they don't have that court sort of storied IPO exit or acquisition, um, there's a whole nother level of capital that has emerged around private equity. And so um, professionalization maybe of what it means to be a startup and, and um, how to do that has just been um, entirely transformed the whole idea of, of being a startup founder and community. Um, I think on top of that, for me personally, um, I think the the level of sophistication that is required to be a founder is tremendously different um, in the sort of like digital based startup world. Um, I think, I, I mean, I, I'm kind of a sucker for like startup history, um, but I think if you go back to some of those early startups from a decade or more ago, uh, both East Coast and West Coast based. Um, you look at something like Foursquare, I think, and I remember in like 2012, if you had like 500 or a thousand active users in your app, um, then that was grounds for raising millions of dollars. Yeah. Um, and, and that idea is just, I mean, in, in a way uh, it's still, important to show active usage in another way the mere fact of having a thousand people sign up for your thing doesn't mean that they're actually ever going to show up again or be engaged in any way and we just didn't have the vocabulary at that time to really think about it yeah um i think it's i think the the, the, the way the ecosystem lives and breathes and moves, is, at least here in New York, has also changed since then. And so I, th I think networking has become harder, um, mm -hmm. especially as you get people who are more and more successful and they're, they're able to demonstrate that success, they become less and less accessible because mm -hmm. they have to have that, whether it's a level of sophistication or just a level of, of busyness, they just, there's just so much more required to be a successful founder that it's so much harder to interact with them and rub shoulders with them the way that we were able to eight, nine years ago. 
agreed. And we also, um, you and I entered at this specific moment where there was a centralized New York tech community. Um, there was New York tech meetup. Um, what was it like the first Tuesday of every month? Um, and there was like one or two other entrants. There was tech drink up where like 500 people would show up at a bar, rooftop bar. <laughs> um, and there, there were just like, you had a sense that if you were at this thing, then you were like a part of the New York tech ecosystem. And it's, it's not bad, but it's just, it's splintered so much as the ecosystem has matured into, well, there's a whole niche community for IoT. There's a niche community for VR. There's a niche community for biotech. There's a niche yeah. community for um, ad uh, like MarTech. Like there's probably 12 or 15 of those at least. Um, and there is no longer a centralized place where you can feel like I can go to this and 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 kind of rub shoulders with all of the muckety mucks of tech. Um, mm -hmm. and, and so you and I kind of coming in and not necessarily knowing what we wanted to do in that moment, but just that we liked this idea of entrepreneurship and community and we wanted to be there. Um, we were afforded a kind of a unique opportunity of self-discovery that I think would be difficult in 2019 in New York City, let alone <laughs> in 2020, when you're basically locked in your house trying to figure out how to meet people on the internet. Right. It, it was so much easier to build relationships back then, both both meaningful relationships as well as adjacent relationships and, and being able to walk into a room. I remember there were years where um, I would I would walk into any any meetup, any event that I went to, and I was either running the event or I knew the people who were. And every now I remember I remember this one time I went to an event and um, it was an event where I didn't know anybody. I didn't know anybody who was running it. I didn't know anybody who was attending it. And I was a little out of my element. Um, because you, cause I was so accustomed to walking into a room and having everybody know who I am and, I, and, and you and I both, because we went to a lot of the same ones. Um, and I don't think it's like that anymore. Yeah. Uh, but it was, speaking of those relationships, like you are somebody who I've always looked up to as somebody who can build and nurture relationships um, and, and, and create opportunities for people to feel special, almost like that Bill Clinton effect. Um, and I'm curious, how how has the act of building and nurturing relationships played a role in preparing you for running a company like Minerva? I appreciate that. Um, and and I will say, I'm not running Minerva. We have, a, we have an amazing team of people that is running Minerva. Um, and I also wanna make sure that we're um, not just being wistful, but offering some value to the folks who are listening in. Um, so, when Josh and I are talking about this idea of, oh, you know, it was great 10 years ago when we could go do this, it's, it's, I think part of the nature of entrepreneurship is that constant challenge of like, well, how, how can you do that today? Um, how can you um, meet people? How can you build and foster those relationships in 2021? Um, and that's uh, much like much like every aspect of building a company is kind of like, well, you can look at the model of the previous person, but you also have to figure out what's next. Um, and so, uh, you know, there, there are apps like um, Clubhouse um, that actually have found a compelling way to meet new people. Um, so uh, to answer your larger question, um, I think first and foremost, it's like, how do you meet new people? Um, it's not easy, um, but there are ways to do it. Um, and there are a bunch of other people like you who are also thinking about how they get to meet new people. Um, whether whether they're just like due to the startup scene or whether they're potentially hiring or looking for a co-founder, like those opportunities exist because there are so many people out there looking for them. Um, and so figuring out where they are is, is just part of the challenge. But in terms of actually building a network, um, I, I'm a believer in making long-term investments in relationships. Um, and it's, it's worked out um, time and time again for me professionally. Um, but find people that you actually like. <laughs> find people not just that, you know, you're interested in because they might get you something, um, but because you genuinely enjoy spending time with them, they, they sharpen your thinking, they give you a better sense of what it is that you want to accomplish, as well as, you know, also having a kind of a, a different mentality 
um, and and hopefully you're setting up yourself with a diverse group of people who who you all um, who you like and, and resonate with each of them, but they all have a perspective that's different from yours. Um, and then and then keep in touch with them. You know that doesn't mean you have to text them every week, but you know every three months, every six months, check in. How's it going? Is there any way I can help you today? Um, and uh, that's ended up paying paying big dividends in ways that I never expected. Um, you know, I'll, I'll like uh, I, I posted a little thing today about a reflection on um, having run Startup Grind um, for several years now, and um, you know, people commented that I hadn't heard from in five or six years, um, and that was pretty cool and rewarding, but. I've also, almost every major professional move that I've made um, is because of one of those relationships. Um, you, the, the company that I ran after, Strategy Hack, called ReCorp, um, I met because Helen Cho from Strategy Hack said, I met this random French guy and I think he could really get along, you should chat with him. Um, and we ended up having coffee like six or eight months later um, and, and start a company together that we ran for five years, um, ultimately, because the coffee turned into a dinner and um, we don't work together anymore, but we still keep in regular touch. Um, and that's, I think, having, um, having a co-founder relationship that can survive the business when the business doesn't work, um, I think has, has ultimately been a testament to me or evidence to me of um, kind of taking the right approach. Yeah, I, I, I think that's that's fantastic the way that, that those things work out when you approach them the right way. Um, I, real quick, a, a couple of things uh, chat related. If, uh, if anybody has any, um, any other services or applications that you've used to network in this past year, um, go ahead and throw those in the chat. I know uh, Lunch Club is a good one where um, it actually connects you on a, on a video chat with, uh, with somebody else who is um, generally related into what you want to do. Um, I know there's Weave. Um, uh, Bumble BFF uh, is, a, is a way that people are, are, are really getting to know each other. Um, they're about to go public, which is awesome. Um, and also, there's a gentleman, uh, I think, in the chat. His name is uh, Theon, Theon Freeman. I think is his second or third time here at a startup grind. Uh, he wants to know if there's any specific tactics that you use to stay in touch with folks you've met from the NYC tech scene. Thanks for that, Theon. <laughs> um, let's see, honestly. Um, events, actually. Um, I, I, and, you know, it's not necessarily applicable to quarantine, but could be. Um, invite people to stuff, um, throw an event and then invite people to it. And the event could be a happy hour at a bar. Um, it could be a game night. Um, it could be something else that's like, it's not an olive branch, but it's just like, oh, I didn't know Peter thought of me that way to invite me to to a personal thing that he was putting together. Um, is an incredibly powerful tool. Um, having a birthday party, and then inviting someone who's who might feel a little bit more like an acquaintance, but someone who you really like, um, do something virtually. There, there are ways to play games online with people. Um, could even do a movie night and then a discussion virtually. Um, so, so I think there are aspects of it that are being creative. Um, I also think take genuine interest in people. Remember details about them. Um, if you remember what their kid's name is, and then six months later you say, oh, you, you, you know, you mentioned that Cecilia was doing this thing, like, how did that go? Um, that can be really engaging to somebody. Um, I think likewise, just saying, hey, like, we just haven't chatted. Do you want to figure out a time to, to do a phone call this weekend? Um, a part of that too is like, there's some social anxiety, right? Because they might never write back. Um, and that's... That's fine. That's okay. And and if you can get yourself over the the rejection, um, there are plenty of people on the other side of that who uh, who are going to respond and yeah. who will embrace it. I think the the other side of that is um, being aware of when someone might be doing that with you, uh, not you you like the royal you. Um, I know I 
the, the, the issue that we all have is that we're all busy and everyone, um, everyone always likes to talk about how busy they are. And, um, and I think uh, I'm, I'm, I'm guilty, I'm equally as guilty of not reaching out when I should, but then also um, like also not following up with somebody who has reached out with me. Um, uh, like jesting, all, all joking aside, Theon is a is, is a long long time member of the Stark Grind family, um, and uh, uh, super happy to see him and a lot of our other friends in there, John Matson as well, and um, uh, and everyone else. Um, and so I think I'm pretty sure Theon messaged me on Christmas and said Merry Christmas, and I feel really bad because I haven't messaged him back. I don't think. Um, and uh, so Theon, I love you, brother. Uh, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna respond to your text as soon as we're done here. Um, but yeah, I think I think so many to your point about remembering people's names, remembering people's kids' names, and, and a hack that I have found is I have an Evernote um, because I use Android and not iPhone. But I have an Evernote where I write down the names of everyone in my neighborhood that I know, like the bartenders, the baristas, the people who work at the restaurants and the shops, so that when I go, I remember their name and I I some, kindly remind, yeah, it's Josh, yeah, and remind them of my name. So then we begin that rapport, and then when I see them again the next time, it's like we're picking back up where we left off, and I think um, that can that can stretch across the relationship um, and, uh, and, and, and really influence um, uh, how the relationships continue to evolve over time. Um, I think so I think so we've, we've spent a good amount of time kind of establishing this as a, as a good practice and a foundation, but, but why is it valuable? It's valuable because you never know when that person who you didn't necessarily know, like, well, not sure we're ever going to work together is going to become, um, you know, one of your pro users or a client or a co-founder or a co-conspirator of some kind. Mm -hmm. um, and, and, you know, when you're, when you're going in with that give first mentality, um, it pays itself back and it's not, it's not going to be clear exactly when or how it will. Um, but it has in so many ways. I mean, so many of those early meetups and the, and the people that I met in those early days have become, um, advisors in a way or mentors or, 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 or actual like business partners. Um, mm -hmm. and so, um, think about these in a way as, as, um, investments of your time and effort, um, spread them liberally. Um, you know, an angel investor might run, write a hundred checks a year, um, build relationships with a hundred people every year see how that goes, see where it goes. And has that been an asset for you is, as you and the team have started this business uh, in, in such a, 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 a crazy time? I struggle to, to not use the word unprecedented um, because that's, it's just a, an overused word. It's like, I think it was like the word of the year. Um, but in things like managing a team and fundraising, like how, how, how is, how is all this work in this, this, this not work, but like the effort and the attention that you've paid to mm -hmm. to these relationships. How has that started to impact the way that you build and manage a team and the way that you raise funds? Yeah. So, so just um, some some real practical examples. Um, Joaquin, who's now the um, co-founder and CEO of Minerva, is someone that I met initially because I was running a meetup um, and I wanted to. I had the the first one that I did was seven people at a bar, um, and I and the prompt was let's talk about entrepreneurship, um, and seven people showed up, um, and those people were really excited about it, and they said this shouldn't be a one off thing, this should be a regular thing, um, and so we started doing a meetup that was called the Pivot for a little while, and then it was called the Inventure Company, um, and and it it never was anything really other than a little meetup. Um, but that then led me to um, one of those seven people was uh, a woman named Amy who went to grad school with a person named Joaquin. Um, and so I met Joaquin eight years ago because Amy thought, well, you know, maybe instead of just doing this at a bar, we should try to get someone to speak about entrepreneurship. Um, and I went to business school with this guy named Joaquin. Um, and then it turned out that Joaquin also had his own meetup called the People Side. Um, and I started going to his meetups. Um, and we ended up, I actually really just resonated with him and I actually asked him to be a mentor of mine. Um, and we've had coffee every week for every two weeks for the last eight years, basically. Um, wow. He became a groomsman at my wedding, um, along with 
the the one time that strategy hack did actually sell an enterprise level offering um, was to an agency called McGarry Bowen. Um, someone named Tina connected me to Craig. Um, Craig was the only person who ever bought a strategy hack from us um, on a, on a corporate two. level. We had two. <laughs> uh, yes, yes, I apologize. You, had, you are the correct. other one that I negotiated with, with uh, um, IBM. Yes, yes. Craig, Craig was definitely a pioneer in, <laughs> he was number one. He was number one, I love you, Craig. Um, and he um, also became a groomsman at my wedding. Um, lo and behold, um, the two of them met each other because they were both groomsmen at my wedding and they had not previously known each other. Um, and Craig really? is the co-founder. Yeah, yeah, I correct. Didn't know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, Craig is the co-founder and, and chief product officer of Minerva. I um, wonder how so much time the chicken dance has resulted in people starting a company. <laughs> um, so Craig and Joaquin ended up starting Minerva. Um, and they brought on a CTO and they were able to get an early round of funding. Um, and, uh, and at which point I was lucky enough to be able to jump in. Um, and, and none of those things would have happened if all of the previous stuff hadn't happened. Um, and it's not to say, look, you know, in, in some alternate universe, Joaquin and Craig would have bumped into each other on a street corner and had an epiphany and, and started a company and, <laughs> or, or, you know, they would have started something with somebody else. And, um, but, uh, and then, and then one of the early investors in Minerva was someone that I met on a, um, on like a, an investor junket kind of thing um, that turned out to get really excited about Minerva. Um, there, there's just so many little stories like that, that, so, so I think we've dwelled on this quite a bit, but it's just, it's been so obvious to me that every time you give, uh, and every time you invest in someone, you just get so much back, not to mention, um, that, that Theon, who we got to work very closely with in building Startup Grand New York, is now also a team member of Minerva. Yeah. Um, awesome. and, and so that would never have happened if we hadn't really invested the time and energy in building this startup grant community. Yeah, and, and I think that is so fantastic uh, that, that the, the people in this orbit have have started, uh, and not even necessarily your orbit, but like the orbit that you are a part of, that you have guided, have somehow have, have all come together uh, and been able to play really crucial roles in, in building something great. Um, how, as we start wrapping this up, uh, and getting to to another um, significant announcement here, uh, what if how has this the, these values that have guided you through this past year? How have these contributed to um, to, to all of this? I know you've mentioned um, things like conviction and a couple of others. Um, how, how do you how do you how how have you practiced these, and how have these contributed to everything that you've already talked about? Yeah, I, I think there's a real false narrative in general startup press that. Um, building the next unicorn is all about um, sharp elbows and um, kind of like climbing your way to the top as a sole founder. Um, and, and look, we've we've also seen plenty of examples where that seems to be the case, whether it's Adam Newman at WeWork or Elon Musk. Um, they're, they're definitely like um, people who are in it for for personal glory and personal wealth. Um, but there are also, uh, I think, and I hope, believe a larger group of people who are in it to actually build things that people love. Um, and you don't do that in a fly-by-night operation. Um, you have to do it based around values and, and building a team around shared values. Um, and I think Minerva has done an incredible job there and has a lot of great leadership there. Um, and, and I'm a bit of a convert, honestly, um, based on Minerva, because I've had plenty of experiences where I got really jaded, um, and, and where relationships were really difficult because it was, um, because we were in it for the glory and not <laughs> for the actual value delivery. Um, how do you deliver value without having values of your own? Mm -hmm. and yeah, you mentioned conviction, humility, and, and a little bit of luck 
um, and how those <laughs> those play a role together and, and in the right combination can yield really great things. Yes, um, luck comes into it. Um, and I think that's that's another part of those cycles, right? Like people come in for one cycle, they, they like make a lot of noise about how they're the next great Thomas Edison or, or uh, Steve Jobs or whoever they want to equate themselves with. Um, and then it doesn't work out and they kind of disappear. Um, and so there's there's a huge amount of grit um, that goes into it because luck is just a factor. Um, I have some very good friends that started a company um, and and raised pre-seed round. And then there were some market dynamics. The whole market just shifted out from under them. Um, and something that they couldn't have foreseen just completely made their business irrelevant. Um, and um, it's just the luck of the draw, but um, a testament to them, um, they were able to close that business and maintain good relationships with those investors. Several of their investors said, we would love to invest in whatever your next project is. Um, and that, that, doesn't, that doesn't happen <laughs> when you are just like, in it to to um, big up yourself, um, it happens because you're really trying to make an impact. Mm -hmm. So, what does all this mean for the the future of of startup grind here in New York City? Uh, so, if anybody is new here and, and hasn't been to one of these before, um, it's usually Peter asking the questions, and it's usually Peter the one driving the conversation and um, and, and looking knowingly at the at the speaker and, and nodding his head and, and coming up with something really creative and, and a really great question to ask, uh, following whatever they have to say. Um, so, this is a little bit of a flip. I don't know that Peter's ever been interviewed on the startup grind before, um, but you are the you've been the director in New York City for. Gosh darn, six, seven years now. How did you get started being the director? You weren't the first, but you were almost the first. Yeah, I think that's right. Uh, I think it might have been to, like February 2014. Um, and uh, there are a few before me, including a major shout out to Brian Park, who was running both the New York City and Washington, D.C. chapters simultaneously, um, which was a, a feat of ridiculousness. Um, and uh, so, so I've been privileged to be the director here for seven years. Um, and this event, as you're alluding to, represents a kind of um, handing over the reins. Um, so Josh, I, I don't think that this is by any means your, your first uh, show running of Startup Grind, let alone your first show running experience of which you've done many, um, but very excited to uh, to see the next chapter of Startup Grind New York City as I hand the baton off to you and and the incredible team who's helped put all these events together. Yeah, that's uh, it's really exciting. And then um, I was uh, really honored that I was able to um, to work with you and the team over the past several months into um, figuring out a, a a new path forward. Like I mentioned before, people get busy and um, and we work on things that uh, that. that that require our time and energy. And I think I know for a long time, um, when I first started with uh, with Verizon and their 5G labs, um, I spent about a year uh, of not being able to contribute very much uh, to Startup Grind. And I ended up um, almost taking that same route. Um, and and I know that you, you building the company and, and Minerva um, uh, doing such amazing things with such an awesome team, uh, many of whom are here in the audience tonight. Um, I, I want. I think us, the, the entire team, wants to make sure that you and, and the company has a chance, an opportunity to, um, to to really shine and grow. And so um, I'm happy that I am able to um, uh, to to take that uh, responsibility um, and, uh, and 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 follow in your footsteps. Um, by no means uh, are, are we done. I feel feel like I'll still be talking to you um, about uh, running the chapter for for a while now, even though I've been with you almost since the beginning. Um, but it uh, it really is a, a a great honor to be to be taking over the chapter um, of Startup Grind uh, after um, such a such a great career of it with you. Yeah, absolutely. And I know uh, you've you've given me some insight into the ideas that you have for this upcoming year. So I'm just super super excited to see it continue to grow and evolve. 
Yeah, with uh, such an awesome team as well, uh, with everyone in the audience. I think we, we've already named everybody there, um, but uh, super excited to continue working with everyone. Um, right about now is the time that we open the floor for our audience to let us know what you are working on. Um, rather than asking questions for Peter, uh, go ahead and uh, give us a 30 second rundown of what you're working on and how the community can help. Uh, and if you've got ways to help the community, then go ahead and let us know that too. Um, so if you want to, uh, go ahead and uh, put the word, um, I guess, me in the chat um, and we'll make you a quick presenter um, and you can come off mute and, uh, and then you can let us know what you're working on. Um, like I said, a quick 30 seconds of what you're doing um, and then uh, uh, give us a way to get in touch with you. Ah, all right, Senior Matson. Let's do this. What are we doing here? This is, okay. this is just going to turn into a love fest, I think. It might. All right, John, uh, you should be able to come off mute and turn your speaker mic and uh, and mic on if you want. There he is. Hey, how's there it going? Go. Can you guys hear me? Hey, John. Yeah, yeah. Hey, this is, it does feel like a, a a love fest. I'm like, this is amazing to to have uh, you get interviewed, Peter. I I, I would love to. I, I have to jump to a six o'clock, but um, I just wanted to say like, you guys crushed it, Josh. You're going to continue to crush it. Um, for anybody who doesn't know, I got to work with uh, Peter and Josh on Startup Grind for for years and loved every second of it. So. Um, anyway, I'm working on Location Engine now, um, which is uh, what I'm calling basically the Spotify for on-the-ground information. Basically, everything that you possibly could, it's like a recommendation engine for all the minutia and little details as you navigate a journey. Um, and we are um, now a distributed team, but mostly New York-based. Um, we're raising uh, capital. We've had some nice traction with some uh, distributors and some deals. Uh, but raising round and looking to connect with um, uh, potential investors, with um, potential partners, people who want to get involved with that concept. Um, we're in stealth mode. We're in a public stealth. We're live in an airport. And uh, a public stealth is like a weird oxymoron, but uh, it's how we've had to navigate. Um, but yeah, like, we'd love to talk to anybody who's around. I'll drop my email in the chat, but um, just want to say thanks to the community for you know, being awesome. And thanks to Peter and Josh for uh, continuing to make it awesome and putting this event on. Also, I'm pretty sure that John Matson never sleeps. <laughs> uh, that is a true characteristic. Yeah, because uh, <laughs> of course you have a 6 p.m. meeting. You probably have an 8 p.m. meeting too. <laughs> I, uh, I'm a total like productivity nut, as you know, and I have like this timular and I clocked that I did 18 hours of meetings in two days. The last two days, which is gross. Um, but uh, yeah, anyway, um, we'd love to work hard with anybody who wants to work hard with what we're working on. So uh, shoot me a note, guys. This is this is my email. Um, yeah, I, I do have to jump, but great to see you all and looking forward to the next Startup Grind event. Yeah. Thanks, John. For Thanks, anyone John. who's not aware, John was also one of the fellow directors, and the three of us uh, held many, many meetings together, spent much, much time together. Um, John was kind enough to open up his office for all of our weekly meetings and uh, even gave us our favorite happy hour spot. So, um, <laughs> John, we, we've missed you for, for a little while since you've been crushing it with, uh, with Location Engine, and I um, uh, look forward to being able to see you when this uh, whole crazy pandemic thing's over. Likewise. Absolutely. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Josh. Thanks, Peter. Talk to you soon. All right. Uh, Stefan, um, appreciate you putting that in there. Um, I need to uh, pull you off of attendee mode into uh, presenter mode. So give it just a second. You should be able to unmute yourself um, as well as turn on your camera if you choose to. Um, but yeah, please feel free to uh, give us a shout and let us know uh, what you're working on and how we can help. Looks like it's taking a second for him to get in. Um, he says they need help with marketing. Um, yeah, uh, marketing can be a very broad category. Um, Stefan would love to hear a little bit more about what it is that you are working on. 
um, and, and where you're incorporating businesses. Um, uh, apparently, Stefan's not able to get in, it looks like, from the chat. Ah, oh, that's too bad. I even tried making him a host. Uh, that didn't work. So uh, we should say that this is an experimental platform. <laughs> yeah. Um, that, uh, Josh, this will, I'm sure, be <laughs> one of your first We'll be majors. evaluating it. Uh, Stefan, go ahead and uh, put, put a way that we can get in touch with you. If there's anybody in the audience who uh, might be able to help you with marketing uh, or incorporating the business, go ahead and throw your email there into the chat, and um, hopefully somebody will be able to help out. All right. Uh, so I want to thank you, Peter, um, not only for this incredible dialogue, um, but for being my friend uh, for the past seven or eight years. Um, it has been a wild ride. Um, uh, late night, December 31st, uh, business and corporation signatures and, um, and, and all of the crazy things that went along with Strategy Hack and Startup Grind. Um, uh, it's been a true pleasure knowing you and uh, I'm very, very grateful um, that you stood up uh, at that growth hacking meetup such a long time ago and that I um, casually handed you my business card like I was too cool for school. Um, <laughs> you know? I, I appreciate you, Josh. I appreciate those very kind words. Um, and I think it's a testament and, and something that I have to remind myself on a regular basis is to put yourself out there. Um, and um, I, I'm so glad that I did. I'm so glad that we had the opportunity to build two different things together now. Um, and uh, it speaks to everything that we've covered in the chat of um, just finding people that you really resonate in. And um, especially especially with a business partner, you are you know, agreeing to spend 10 hours of your life with that person five, six days a week. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's you know, probably equivalent to, if not more than a lot of people spend with their spouses. Yeah, <laughs> yep. absolutely. You gotta make sure you like somebody. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's a good thing we do. Uh, also, thank you to our audience for joining in. Uh, this conversation has been recorded and it'll be available in the next few days if anybody wants to share this content with their communities. Uh, we'll be back next month to further discuss how immersive reality is revolutionizing the fashion industry through new sustainable supply chains. Uh, I think uh, the, 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 the entrepreneur in question is in the audience tonight. Uh, checking this out. Um, we're super excited uh, to talk with Tracy Wong um, about her startup, Vore. Uh, and as a bonus, our February event will be conducted in virtual reality. Uh, if you don't already have a headset uh, and have an account on Altspace VR, uh, now is your chance. I uh, highly recommend you do both of those things. It is going to be, as I understand it, the first startup grind in VR. Uh, to put that in perspective, there are over 600 chapters of Startup Grind all over the world, and this will be the first one conducted in VR, and we're super excited. So um, go ahead and check out uh, more information about that and RSVP for that event on startupgrind.com um, by locating the NYC chapter there. You can RSVP for free, um, and there'll be instructions on how you can prepare for this event happening on February 10th in virtual reality. Uh, so thank you so much, everyone. Um, we are uh, super excited to see you next time. And thank you, everyone, for joining us here tonight with Peter Christel. Thank you so much, everybody.